I was always somebody who kind of zoned out and put myself in a game situation and would like go crazy. If there was a move that I was working on, I would picture myself in a game situation doing that move and succeeding like thousands of times. Like that's what a practice session for me would look like. It's funny how the, the digital era helped me kind of like stay occupied with other things while I was injured. You know, like before, I remember being injured with An One back in the day. I missed one of the tours. I think it was like 2006. I played four games and I missed the entire year after that. And I remember just being bored and really not like <clears throat> the ball wasn't in my court as far as business because we signed traditional endorsement deals. And then I had like an agent and they kind of did everything from there. But now when I get injured, it's like, there's so much more to be done. Like there's like content that you have put away that you could reuse. There's different like campaigns and different things you can be involved in. Um, there's appearance opportunities and stuff like that. So I've always been able to stay busy uh, during the downtime instead of just being laid up, feeling like everything's halted. And honestly, I love the term influencer. I think like an athlete might feel some type of way about that because you want to be defined as an athlete, but Right. For me, I, f I feel honored that, you know, the digital era has brought new opportunity and sort of like rebirthed me because I, I remember there was a time a lot of people don't know, like when N1 ended 2009, I personally went broke. I'm sure a bunch of my teammates did, too. They've never really spoken about it publicly. Yeah. I don't know for sure, but it was a hard time. And I remember even going to like packed out high school games and college games. And usually like now if I go to a basketball event, I need security. You know what I mean? Right. But I remember at that point. I went, I remember going to a couple crowded like basketball centered events and only like maybe one person would recognize me or not even anybody. And it was because like what I learned was like people forget really, really fast, you know, when, when something's off the radar. And for me, I'm thinking like I would have to transition into doing something else. You know what I mean? Like me as a basketball player was over. So the fact that the, the whole digital era could, provide opportunity for me to be rebirthed onto the not quite mainstream, but maybe mainstream basketball. That was humbling. You know what I mean? So I love the term influencer, social media influencer, whatever, you know, that was my hope. And then even from then on trying to be more transparent across the board, I think was best. If I look at like guys who I look at as inspiration on YouTube, aren't necessarily even athletes. It's like top vloggers that do it at the highest level. And they have ultimate vulnerability. You know everything about their life. You know their family, where they live, their environment, their space. And so I wanted to do a better job of that. I do know that my audience, it was hard to get them to tune in to things away from the basketball court. So that's always been the drawback from that. Not necessarily not wanting to be vulnerable. I just know that when I did those away from the court videos, there was less interaction there. But I also think that um, there needs to be a higher production level, uh, better edit, better shoot, better everything. If you're, if I'm going to do lifestyle stuff, because basketball is pretty standard, right? You can't shoot basketball a whole, there's a few ways you can shoot basketball. There's not tons, right? With lifestyle, there's, there's a billion ways you could shoot that. So um, yeah. So I am focused on doing more like lifestyle content and being more vulnerable moving forward. Yeah. When I, when I look at YouTube, uh, I do watch a few people in the YouTube Hooper community, which is a trip to me now that it's a community because I st oh, oh 09, I just started uploading videos being a YouTube, the first YouTube Hooper in efforts to just get bookings. You know what I mean? Like, cause I was playing a lot internationally because and one was still hot yep. away from the States. So, um, I do look at a few people in the community um, that do numbers, but I'm also looking at like, like I said, like top vloggers, you know what I mean? Like I look at, um, you know, David Dobrik, Logan Paul, Casey Neistat, uh, guys who all have very different styles, but they're incredible what they do. And they, they wouldn't have got to where they're at if they didn't love production. That's one thing I always tell about social media influencers, like people want to do this, but you kind of have to like production. Like if you don't like production, it's going to be really hard to be consistent and really to go after it. Um, but the, anyway, those guys' production is on a whole nother level than mine is. So I'm trying to up it constantly. Um, and those are guys I look to in the space. 2005, I started to see people in the street that pass me and be like, oh, I love your work. You know, and the conversation was like, oh, thanks for checking out the show. And they were like, no, I actually saw your stuff on YouTube. And so I didn't know what that was. YouTube started 04. 
Mm -hmm. So I started looking into it and I was like, wow, this is pretty crazy. Checking out videos. And I think 06, they made the videos viewable on phone, the the mobile. uh, They didn't have the app, but they had the browser and you could actually watch it, even though it was a little bit blurry. Yep. But it was still in like several countries. So I remember going to Europe and Australia around 2006, early 06. And they were like, oh, we've seen your stuff on YouTube, boom, boom, boom. So I started really thinking like, wow, this is global. And what's to stop? Uh, no, I asked myself, what's the difference between this and a TV channel? Because at the end of the day, a TV channel is only just because you're so used to going to the TV, you turn it on. It's telecast probably in different countries and why. And I was like, this is the same thing, except it's to the choice of the viewer to go to the computer. But everybody was saying that the computer and the internet was coming more the way. So I didn't know it would become like it is today, but I did think that it was become more popular. And so I actually had a friend of mine make a channel on YouTube and it was, it actually was on his channel, but I had to make me a few videos. He, he's actually an editor for Microsoft. Now I went to high school with him. He's cool. a beef editor. So he made me a few mixes and they did like a million views in a week. And so I was like, let's just flood YouTube because at that point it was like young YouTube wasn't very saturated. Like if you had a dope basketball video, like anybody who checked out YouTube might have seen you if they like sports. Yeah. So it was really young. And so we went hard there. And then Google AdSense came into play like 2008. And so I was like, oh crap, like this is on his channel. Yeah. So he was cool though. He let me upload and I started my own channel in 2009. And I got with a kid out in San Diego. Uh, this kid, Alberto, he is a big channel, Alberto Entertainment. And he actually sh- made my first three videos and he showed me how to use Final Cut Pro uh. and how to edit. And I was really on it because I was like, man, these videos are getting a lot of views quick. And I was like, this has to be something. And I even got a movie role. I had a, I got a movie role in a Chris Brown movie that actually didn't get released um, because of a YouTube video. So this was telling me a lot. Like I was getting all these signals. So I finally started my own channel 2009. I went really hard with it. And it did. It got me some like overseas bookings. People were taking notice. Yeah. And then uh, finally got some viral content about 2013. And that's, it literally came a business in one week. Put it like this. Nobody could ever be great at anything, much less be a great basketball player without an insane amount of time and repetition put into the craft. So for me, um, I actually wasn't a drill guy. Like obviously growing up, I had uh, tons of trainers, clinics, camps, AAU practices, did billions of drills in those times. But when I ever went to the court by myself, I was always somebody who kind of zoned out and put myself in a game situation and would like go crazy. If there was a move that I was working on, I would picture myself in a game situation doing that move and succeeding like thousands of times. Like that's what a practice session for me would look like. And for some people it is drills. It doesn't, I don't even know if that matters. Right. Cause I know like Jamal Crawford didn't do drills either. Right. Yeah. Like he's a guy who's zoned out, put himself in there. But I think the one commonality with that is like an insane amount of repetitions. So yeah, uh, I guess I, I can't say I didn't, I did drills like shooting, right. I would get up yeah. a certain amount of jumpers and that would be a drill form. But yeah, I mean, repetitions, everything I could, I couldn't calculate how many times I've practiced a crossover or something to that degree. You know what I mean? I think, I think perspective has a lot to do with dealing with that. Number one, um, I learned early on that whenever you have a mass following, you're going to have, uh, you're going to threaten people in that space and you're going to have people that just don't like that you have a big platform. I think, I think a lot of people don't know that's just human nature, right? Like if you break onto the mainstream, let's say you have a hit single in music, a bunch of people aren't going to like you, which is like, it's so, it's kind of like disgusting, right? It's like, why is that a thing? And people don't haven't really got to the point where they understand that that's just what it is. So knowing that going in, the second thing is, What I've learned with my career is like, that's how it's supposed to be. I was like, if everybody just said, he's good, he's great. It is what it is. I'm cool with it, whatever. There wouldn't even be challengers, right? Like, like, I feel like God set it up to where for me, it's like, you have those haters. Those are my best videos, right? Somebody talking trash. We get into the game, the tension's high and let's see what happens. You know what I mean? So I feel like in, in a way, it's set up and it's supposed to be like that because then when you succeed, it, it like, it's sort of a 
shocking or a surprise element to it. Yeah. And it can keep going. It's funny. Like I always thought like at a certain point, if I got five to 10 million subs, maybe people would start to understand if I go to a random park, you're not going to get off on me. But I mean, I go up the park, I go to my local neighborhood park, which we shoot videos at sometime here. Yeah. And there'll be high schoolers up there. They talk trash. They, they really think if we suit up, they're going to like beat me. You know what I mean? Like they're, they're, they're confident of that. I think it's just supposed to be like that. Not that I don't get a tremendous amount of love. That's that's the majority.